Hello, everyone, uh, and welcome. My name is uh, Jim Ryan. I am the very new director of research and uh, director of the Middle East program here at the Foreign Policy Research Institute. Um, it's a real pleasure to be with you today to discuss uh, the protests that have been going on in Iran over the last six weeks or so, uh, and what that means for the future uh, of the Is Islamic Republic. Um, before we get started, I just want to note that this program, like all of FPRI's program, uh, programs are made possible by the generous support of our donors, our members, uh, our board of trustees. Uh, and I encourage you that, you know, if this is something that uh, you find interesting and you want to support, please uh, take a look at our website, uh, fpri.org slash contribute and make a small donation on, on our behalf today. Um, all right. So to get us started today, I do want to note one uh, programming change. Unfortunately, uh, we had one panelist uh, have have to leave sort of at the last minute or back out at the last minute due to a, a scheduling issue. Um, but we are very, very, very excited to have with us today uh, Professor Shireen Saidi, who is a, an assistant professor of political science at the University of Arkansas and director of their Middle East program and also a member of the National Iranian American Council. Um, Professor Saidi is the author of the very recent book, Women and the Islamic Republic, How Gendered Citizenship Conditions the Iranian State, which was released uh, earlier this year from Cambridge University Press. Uh, and we're going to be talking today a little bit about her book and a little bit about why her book matters in this particular moment uh, and get her take on what's happening uh, in the midst of the protests uh, today. So I'm very, very Pleased to have you with us, Shireen. Thank you for being here. I know this is, and you're very in demand right now, all, like all of our colleagues. Um, and I want to just, you know, thank you for having, having, giving us the time today. Um, Sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> I just want to say thank you. Okay. Um, so, Shireen, I, I want to start off by uh, just giving you an opportunity to uh, address the thesis of your book and tell us what kinds of findings you made in studying uh, you know, really how women and citizenship have developed in Iran since 1980. Your book addresses this sort of in, in three different eras and stages in the midst of the Iran-Iraq war, uh, in the midst of the 1990s, and then in the post-2009 uh, moment, uh, it, three very distinct eras in modern Iranian history. This isn't a flat you know, period by any means. So uh, perhaps you could tell us a little bit about how you've seen uh, citizenship for women in Iran develop over the course of uh, the last 30, 40 years, and why that matters to the folks uh, who are protesting in the streets today. Thank you so much, Jim. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, and I'm very grateful that you created the space. Uh, of course, the events right now are very disturbing, but new communities are forming and it's wonderful to have met you in this organization in the process. Uh, my book uh, began as a doctoral dissertation at the University of Cambridge. And uh, upon finishing it at Cambridge, I returned to Iran and I lived in Iran for two years and I worked there and I taught at the University of Tehran. And basically I rewrote half the book uh, because I kind of, you know, going on these short trips for field work is one thing and then living there and, and you know, going through everyday life in that context is very different. So, uh, in my book and as a PhD student and still today, I was very much interested in non-elite women. And what I mean by non-elite are women that are not affiliated with any kind of organized feminist movement and they're not a part of the state. So the women that, that you know, we often see in images, uh, women that uh, many want to give voice to, but we don't really hear from them explicitly. So I was interested to become acquainted with these women. Um, my book relies on uh, close to 10 years of field work in Iran and in the diaspora. Um, it is uh, one of the few books that brings the history of leftist women, secular women, and Islamic women next to one, one another, the political history of their activism. So I conducted interviews with political, uh, former political prisoners uh, in the diaspora. I returned to Iran and I conducted interviews uh, with women that participated in the Iran-Iraq war as um, you know, soldiers, warriors in the war front or as nurses and doctors, and also women uh, that were just uh, employed and working at you know, coming of age um, 
at the intersect of revolution and war. Uh, what was it like to enter the workforce in that moment? So this is a book that brings their political history next to one another. I also, upon my return to Iran, I, I conducted um, really close to two years of field work um, among uh, pro-regime uh, supporters. And parts of that is published in my book. Uh, and you can also, if you go into Google Scholar, a lot of this material will come up as well. And so uh, what I wanted to understand, a lot of the literature in political science talks about citizenship as being central to democracy. And we often think about it in the context of democracy. So much so that when I started my research, um, both research participants and political elites in Iran, but also uh, academics and, and students abroad, said there is no such thing as citizenship in Iran. It's not a democracy, so you don't have citizenship. And so one of the main contributions of my book is that it pushes that uh, foundational understanding of political science that uh, citizenship uh, can only be found in democracies. And I argue that uh, Iran actually has a very um, aggressive and uh, potentially tr transformative form of citizenship. So what the book does is that it brings the experiences of uh, different groups of women together um, to understand what women's resistance uh, means for state formation. And each chapter of women in the Islamic Republic touches upon the different forms and scales of citizenship that have developed in post-1979 within the context of the Iran-Iraq war, legal inequality, ambiguous governance, and the legacies of the war. Um, for those that are interested in Iranian politics in this particular moment, uh, one of the characteristics of the Islamic Republic, my book argues, or one of my findings, is that uh, the state is often forced to follow the lead of uh, women in society. So uh, women, although this, we can talk about why this moment is different, but Iranian women have been leading um, progressive movements, not just since the early 1900s, but you know, since 1979, they've been at the forefront of every progressive movement. Uh, and often, you know, there's there's been elements of, um, we can talk more about the state feminism. So there's been women within the state um, who might ascribe to what some argue to be Islamic feminism. Uh, there have been women within the state that uh, particularly since uh, the 2009 contested presidential election, there has been a push towards neoliberal citizenship. So you also see that within the state. We've had organized feminist movements um, many campaigns, the Million Signature Campaign, Stop Stoning Forever Campaign, um, Change the Male Face of Parliament Campaign. Uh, and a lot of these campaigns were created because um, really by the end of the reform period, women's uh, women right activism was considered to be a security issue, even though overwhelmingly the women were calling for reform, um, reform of the law to strengthen the family and create safer space for children and families. And so, um, with the state not being able to tolerate even that much transformation, a lot of the activism went underground and came out in the forms of brief campaigns. Uh, and so my book, while I don't specifically talk about uh, these specific, uh, you know, organized women's rights movements, I argue that all of these different aspects of women's rights struggles uh, come together to oftentimes push the state towards changing its policies and its style of governance. And so much of what we're seeing today, not only does it have a, a very clear history in post-revolutionary Iran, you can also see it in the region. Um, I highly recommend uh, the book of my colleague Val Moradam. Uh, she has a new book out by uh, with a co-author. I Forgive me, I, I can't remember the co-author's name, but uh, it's, a, it's a book that talks about um, how gender is not just a uh, an issue in the uprisings in in, um, in the Middle East. That it's not. Oftentimes, when we talk about this topic, uh, it is we're interested to know what role did women play, if any, and what did they gain afterwards. And Val uh, and her co-author argue that in fact, um, women are an independent factor. So women are actually pushing uh, these social movements. Um, and, and revolutions really forward. Mm -hmm. And so my book kind of uh, contextualizes this in the Iranian context. That's that's uh, fantastic, Shireen. And you know, I, I really have to agree, there's a, there's a kind of a nasty tendency sometimes uh, when looking at feminist movements in the Middle East, and especially at moments in history when, uh, you know, women seem to have 
made progress, it often gets characterized as something that's gifted to them by a male state, right? I mean, this is a narrative you see in Turkey. This is a narrative you saw in Iran uh, in an earlier era. It's a narrative you, you've seen, you've seen uh, elsewhere in the region. And it's really kind of essential to see this the other way, which is that these are rights that were demanded or, or progress that was demanded by women actively in the street, in politics, in the press. And uh, you know the state was really forced to respond. And when we look at a state like the Islamic Republic, it's really easy to see uh, the responses that are most dramatic, most repressive. And of course, these are are awful. But it's uh, these responses are responses that are demanded by women one way or another. And so this sort of leads me to to ask you about you know this current wave of protests. Why is it different from uprisings that we've seen even in the last few years? Uh, you know, what are women demanding now and why is the, the state responding with harsh repression this time? Yeah, those are really complicated questions um, as a researcher, especially since I'm not there. So I, I will do my best. I'm drawing a lot on the analysis of my colleagues as well. I think what is what strikes me as significant uh, and really makes me incredibly proud um, is that despite the fact that it's a very uh, tragic situation, um, but there was an article that came out in Foreign Affairs, I believe, uh, a few days ago, and one of the authors was Fatima Harirat Jew, and, and the authors made a really wonderful, uh, a very clear and exact uh, claim. Um, they argued that uh, most of the uprisings in the Middle East that we have seen have been uh, due to, they've been triggered by the death of a young man. And this is the first time that we're seeing an uprising triggered by the um, uh, killing of a woman that is in police custody or the death of a woman that is in police custody. Uh, and so we can see it as a form of police violence and we can see it, uh, for me, it's just very exciting because I see it as a movement that is very much so um, looking to dismantle uh, pr policing and surveillance and prisons. And there's also a legacy of that uh, within Iran among feminists. For instance, Nargis and Mohammadi has written about this. Um, Gilo Bani Yaqub has written about this. They have books on this. They're based in Iran. Uh, and so for me uh, to see that, it's, it's very exciting. And what's significant is that not only is it uh, is the uprising triggered um, by a woman's death, but also we see this overwhelming presence. Um, I've said in many talks, there's a lot that we can debate and will continue debate to, to, to debate for years to come. But what's undeniable is that Iranian men overwhelmingly came out and not only um, did they protect the bodies of, of women, uh, which that protection shouldn't be taken lightly. I'm reminded of um, when, um, Camilla Harris uh, was, you know, was just becoming vice president. There was some articles um, that were written where uh, black women and black scholars were arguing that just seeing her protected by security, that was so um, moving for them because as black women, they hadn't experienced that kind of protection of their bodies. And that resonates with me as an Iranian woman. And so when I see men in the street risking their life and dying to protect women's, not just a woman's uh, body, but her right to autonomy, her right to do what she wishes to do with her body. I think this is absolutely um, revolutionary and there's no going back from that. It opens many new doors. Um, for instance, legal reform that would have to be carried out and many other changes that just come from that one um, that one uh, uh, occurrence that we know has uh, panned out into something tangible. And so in that sense, uh, that for me, the, the um, protests are quite um, significant. In terms of what people want, I wanna make a, a distinction here. I think there's a lot of analysts that are speaking on behalf of the nation or the people. And as a scholar, it's just, that's not that's something that I'm not comfortable with. And so when I speak, I, I think of it more in terms of at protesters and what the protesters want. And I think even within that, there's, there's diversity um, in terms of what they're asking for and uh, what they are um, 
how they're appealing to the state. Uh, for some, I think there's definitely like we're hearing slogans of a complete, um, you know, regime change internally. Uh, there are people who are saying this is not feasible anymore and we don't want, you know, an Islamic Republic in Iran. There are others that are just participating and um, uh, civil disobedience and uh, civil disobedience can include um, aggression and violence. It's not necessarily nonviolent, um, but it is civil disobedience. So there's a difference, I think, between um, the different strategies that are being used and perhaps uh, the different demands that protesters have. This is something that will require, for me, like extensive field work and research to draw conclusions about it. Uh, but at the moment, uh, this is what I, what I find significant. The diversity, the consistency, um, coming out into the streets every day, although, you know, that may ultimately not be enough. It will have to expand beyond presence in the streets, many analysts are arguing, but um, in that in that sense, I think it, these are the main points that have grabbed my attention. That that's great. So I, I want to follow up with you, uh, sort of, to ask you to help us tease out this diversity issue a little bit. Um, you know, your your book covers a long period, uh, you know, stretching back to 1980, and sort of starts off with women who experienced uh, the Iran Iraq War. You know, the largest generation, as you know well, in Iran today was born after the Iran-Iraq War. It's it's folks my age, frankly, um, people who weren't born, were, didn't grow up experiencing the revolution. Uh, you know, were not born into a revolutionary society. Um, do you you know, based on your research, I mean, how do you, how can you explain to us sort of the difference, the generational differences in Iran? vis-a-vis -vis the women's movement and these kinds of politics. And then also, I mean, you know this better than I do, but Iran is an incredibly ethnically diverse and geographically diverse uh, society. It, it's, it's often not unlike the United States sociologically in this respect. Uh, and what does it mean, you know, in this moment, you know, oftentimes we see lots of protest moments that are, you know, very sectoral or very regionally focused. You know, the fact that this these protests seem to be happening all over the country, what is, what's the significance of that in your uh, estimation? Okay. Um, so this is a very important question about generations, and I would add to that also trauma. So the Islamic Republic, unfortunately, has been very effective in killing the elders, killing the seniors and also silencing them. So whether we're talking about leftist activists from the 1980s um, up to secular activists of the 1990s, intellectuals and writers, it has very systematically, or when we think about like intellectuals such as myself who can't go back. So, and we want to, like we write our main audience might be in Iran, but we are not given the space to talk about our research in Persian and in our, in our country of birth. So uh, they have been very effective at distancing the young, uh, the younger generation from the elders. And they've also, uh, because of the significant pressure that activists are under, including women's rights activists and the, and the, um, and the negotiations that they have to take on in order to um, remain uh, in the political scene, th that kind of negotiation has also created distance with the younger generation. And so this is why I think we, we um, see sort of this, not just this uh, deep anger, but also a sense of, um, if they go, you know, among the young people, this this idea that if they go, it's just we just want them to go. We don't care who comes. Um, this this returning and going back to the Pahlavi and the monarchy as an ideal hearing through the, that I'm hearing through the media like everyone else. And so I think the the state is responsible for that. The state is responsible for um, uh, you know creating the conditions where citizens feel so incredibly hopeless, where young people. People are disconnected from their history, uh, where they 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 almost ridicule intellectuals. Let's remember that started in the Islamic Republic. That anti-intellectualism, you know, took height during the Ahmadinejad presidency, where it became so common for everyone to call anyone who disagreed with them was bisavod or someone who's uneducated. And so this kind of uh, disrespect of elders, of intellectuals, of uh, people with different opinions. Uh, I think it's it's dangerous for the movement because I, I do think that social movements, the heart and the engine of social movements 
are the are the activists. They are the people people on the ground in Iran and the future of Iran is for them and it will be determined by them. But I think that having academics, intellectuals and scholars, including those inside and outside of the country in conversation with activists can, can help broaden um, their, their kind of vision and the tools uh, that they feel that they could, you know, that they could rely on. And so I think that issue of generations is, is really, um, is significant. Um, yeah, I, and I wanted to follow up on the issue of uh, ethnicity and and geographic oh, yes. diversity in Iran. I mean, again, like you've experienced the women's movement in different places at different times. You know, can we understand anything about you know, what it means to see you know I, women in the south uh, protesting versus women in the north? A uh, you know in sites like Abadan versus Tehran or something like this. Um, you know, help us understand that a little bit better. Sure, yes. And my for my research, uh, I travel throughout Iran and I, I am Bakhtiari. So I come from like a tribal uh, background myself from southern Iran and Masjid al-Suleiman, which is one of the most um, underserved uh, areas, regions in Iran. And so I think there's a lot of emphasis put on the diversity of the protesters and uh, how it's happening all over the country. And it's not just in Tehran and it's not just, you know, uh, the, the wealthier uh, segments of society. Well, I mean, if you look at the academic scholarship, at least for the last 10 years, scholars have been arguing that the gap between more than 10 years, I mean, 15, at least 15 years, they've been arguing that the gap between uh, different uh, social groups in Iran is closing and that people really have similar grievances. And, uh, and it's not just their grievances that brings them together. Uh, Iranians have experienced state feminism, which as if you read Bal Muqaddam's work um, in, in the Arab uh, Middle East, she argues that countries that had an experience with state feminism, however, you know, um, insignificant it might seem to, to those of us living abroad, but those countries, they women played a more dominant role in the uprising and they also had more gains at the end of the uprising. And so Iran is a country that has had state feminism, they've had um, the uh, you know increase of women in universities, in schools, education. All of this I think comes together to bring people closer um, to one another in terms of their grievances. But I think there's something else that I don't think we can really overlook. And I'm referring to um, the research of a colleague named Hadi um, Kahal, Kahal Zadeh, where he writes about the sanctions. Um, and I think this is really important to keep in mind when we think about uh, the different factors. This is not to say people are only in the street because of sanctions, but it's really difficult to overlook um, these astonishing um, statistics. So Iran's middle class uh, went from 48% in 2017 to 34% by 2020. Um, 13, more, uh, 13 million more Iranians have descended to poverty. Um, and it's very difficult to continue the resistance to participate in strikes when people don't have savings. Um, the, over, the sanctions have had a very devastating effect for female-led households. They have really gone into poverty um, in, in a very rapid way as well. And so I don't think that we can overlook all of, and this is, you know, this is partially, of course, because of, you know, U.S. foreign policy and, and Trump, but it's also because of mismanagement within the country and corruption and so on. And so there are many factors and, and many grievances that bring people together. I don't think that ethnicity uh, and ethnic differences are just not that much of an issue in Iranian society. I, I'm from a region that is mostly Arab Iranians and Bakhtiari people. And, you know, you, you, and my family's lived there their whole entire life. We've never really had conflict. Um, quite to the contrary, we've intermarried. We have, you know, celebrate one another's, uh, you know, good news and, and mourn together. So I, I don't think that the diversity um, in that sense is that significant. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's great. Uh, and you know, the, your point about the kind of class and economic changes over the last, uh, you know, several, you know, I mean, really the last two decades, uh, I, I think is very, very well taken. Um, you know, 
so I think I've heard some commentators and analysts sort of like address this question of, you know, well, in 1979, when you had the revolution, there were these mass strikes uh, across the country, labor unions, uh, workers walking off the job, this sort of thing. That's a that's a very different proposition, uh, you know, for a, a worker or a worker led household in 1979 than it is in 2022 when you you know, have, you know, you might not have the kind of support off the job <laughs> in 2022 that uh, a family might have had in 1979. So it, it becomes much, much more perilous and much more um, risky in that sense uh, to, to um, you know, organize on that level. By the same token, I think it speaks to the, the level of, I, I hate to say despair, but, you know, the level of grievance that we're, and the type of grievance that we're looking at, um, you know, across the country today. Um, I, I, I want to ask maybe one more question, and we've gotten a number of, I think, really interesting questions in the chat. So we'll move we'll move move to that in a little bit. Um, so you've addressed this in a different, uh, in a few different ways, um, you know, throughout our conversation so far. But I think it, it's it's really important to take some time to sort of stress like what the relationship has been historically in the present between you know the the women's movement or you know organized and unorganized. In terms of you know demanding making demands on the Islamic Republic, and a you know related you know but you know really distinct movement within the country and without outside the country that's pro democracy, um, and I think this is a just a, a really really important point because in the midst of these protests you see lots of chanting of slogans as you referenced before that are purely regime change, uh, and you know. I think we're certainly in a moment where the women's movement and the pro-democracy movement have more overlap than they've had in the past, but maybe you can help us understand and, and explain and disentangle the two things a little bit. Yeah, that's that's a really hard question, again, because I think there's, you know, I was talking to a friend today, I really don't want to be the scholar that gives bad news <laughs> and speaking right now there's there, there might be some of that so I really don't want any of my analysis to be used against um, Iranians in the diaspora they have experienced. Um, unbearable pain I mean many of us have lost loved ones that parents family members that we have not been able to attend their funerals. So there's a uh, very much so justified anger and um, reactionary um, kind of behavior at this moment, which I completely understand. But historically, um, there has been a lot of, so th there's been a lot of tension between the women's movement inside Iran and the women's movement outside of Iran. Uh, and so there's, you know, we can look at different phases and different moments in post-revolutionary Iran. One of the most well-known transnational um, networks uh, that exist was Iran is Iranian Women's Studies Foundation, and um, it was founded in the 1990s. They held their first uh, conference in 1990, and so it was a space where feminists abroad could be in conversation with women's rights activists coming from Iran. In these spaces, uh, dating to the 1990s, early 2000s, mid 2000s were spaces where there was a lot of conflict, um, uh, particularly from women in the diaspora in relation to those coming from Iran. Uh, sometimes the, the arguments were quite Islamophobic, the attacks were Islamophobic in nature. Sometimes it was the idea that you're not moving fast enough. This is not radical. This is not what we're interested in. And so I think keeping in mind to, that you know women's rights activists uh, not only have their own personal histories, but they're also existing in historical contingencies of the country and the state or whatever the case may be where they're living. And so it becomes really difficult um, to draw like a linear line and say transnationalism is that I in the United States am your voice while you're in Iran. I mean, this has been very um, much so challenged by uh, leading scholars of transnational activism and uh, and rightfully so because there is there are all kinds of hierarchies that exist in these relations and so I don't want to just uh, present an academic discussion we've seen this actually play out in relationships so we've actually seen campaigns in the diaspora that attack women like Bahora Hidayat who has spent over a decade of her life in prison defending women's rights and human rights and who has spoken in Tehran against 
the political structure, um, has refused to vote and has articulated that in a very intellectual way. So when, when um, many of us see women like Bahore Hedoyat uh, and others um, attacked uh, in Iran who are really paying a heavy price, to me that just sort of highlights the tensions that exist. And I don't wanna say, I don't wanna to place too much blame because we all have our own vision of freedom. We all have a particular understanding of liberation. And I think it's all worthy of respect, every person's opinion. Uh, but when we get into the actual um, politics of, of transnational advocacy, this is where a lot of harm can be done uh, and, and not as much support is being um, offered as we would like to imagine, I think, in some of these instances. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much. So uh, we're going to turn to audience questions uh, in a moment, but I just want to reiterate, if you've seen in the chat, uh, some links to uh, work from Dr. Saidi, uh, including some recent articles that you ought to be able to access uh, right away, please uh, take a look at that. Uh, if, you, if you're interested in, in, in reading more about uh, her work, also her book, uh, like I said before, um, Women in the Islamic Republic, uh, is is available from Cambridge University Press. There's a link to that in the chat as well. I, I spent the morning with it. It's wonderful. It's really rich. Uh, asked a lot of really important questions. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna turn to a few of the questions that we've had in the chat, and I want to encourage folks uh, in the audience to enter um, enter their own questions. Uh, we have oh about uh, 25 minutes or so to to dig into some of this. Uh, I want to go to a question from uh, Jacqueline Reich, uh, who says, uh, "Thank you so much for sharing your insights, Dr. Saidi." My question is that given uh, that Iran's government is driven by the ideology of the jurist guardianship uh, and given that jurists by definition can only be men, uh, can there ever really be a space for influential participation by women in the Islamic Republic? Well, I mean, these are, thank you for your question. Um, so, I mean, women have been present in the public space. One of the reasons I think uh, there's a misconception that we assume that whenever women uh, uh, come out in the streets uh, in non-democratic countries or in semi-authoritarian or whatever the case may be, we assume that what's bringing them, back, bringing them out is uh, not having rights, only not having rights, or only, you know, the, the pressure is so much that now they're, they're, you know, risking their life. There's truth to that. There's absolutely truth to that. Uh, but at the same time, uh, the research and the scholarship uh, and the scientific work shows that oftentimes when women are leading movements the way that they are in Iran, it's actually because they have made some important gains and they are outgrowing the structure in which they live. And so I, I would say that um, it's not really black and white and there's a ton of scholarship um, that talks about uh, you know, what women's rights struggles have looked like uh, in the Islamic Republic. It's by no means been easy or democratic. Um, they've been under fire and attack, but I think it's important to recognize women's agency, even under those circumstances, uh, that I think for many of us, uh, it's very difficult to imagine because it's not just uh, repressive state policies. It's also political, it's the culture of society. It's it's sort of the dynamics of families. It's uh, it's the limits that are created for women from birth. And so it's, it's important to recognize uh, the agency that they practice and not to use some sort of a measuring stick that we, that, that, you know, describes our own personal notions of freedom, but to um, be generous. And that is, I think this is a really important, if you don't take anything away from my talk today, I hope you remember this. The only way that we can fight authoritarianism, uh, colonialism, neoliberalism, all of these structures that, that make us disposable uh, and, and result in um, premature deaths, the only way we can overcome that is to refuse to be irrelevant to one another. We have to stay relevant to one another. We have to continue trying to understand and meet meeting women where they're at in their struggle. And one of the things, if you've ever been a woman that has been in trouble or struggling, one of the wonderful things that anyone can do is just say, how can I help you? What can I do for you? And so I think um, this is a place to start, not from a position of, of passing judgment or evaluating, 
uh, which unfortunately we see so much of this. Recently, we've started hearing the voices of women inside Iran with a history of activism and paying a great, great price for their work. Um, and they are dismissed or you know, called horrible names. And so we have to really challenge that toxic behavior as difficult as it can be because we're human and we're you know, going through a lot, but we, we have to stay relevant to one another. Mm -hmm. that, that's that's uh, fantastic, Shireen. And I might follow up and ask, you know, or, or to just, you know, get your take on this. I mean, you know, so much of the conversation around women in Iran, as it is, you know, with any women's movement across the Middle East uh, under an authoritarian regime, centers on rights. Uh, but oftentimes, I think when you look at these feminist movements a little more deeply, rights are they know very well rights are not enough. Uh, rights don't put you know bread on the table, basically. Um, you know, rights, uh, women's the women's rights movement in Iran, for instance, is what has allowed women to gain enormous, uh, enormously outsized positions in universities. You know, education that is actually unattainable in many other much more uh, we would think uh, you know repressive societies in, in terms of women. But that's nothing if once they you know, graduate from college that they don't have a job to go to, or they don't have a way to express that education within society. So maybe you can tell us a little bit more about like social demands of the women's movement, you know, aside from rights and why, how that interplay works. Well, um, you know, if you look at the history of women's rights activism in Iran, it's always had uh, multiple um, sort of goals. One is legal reform, which uh, you know every expert abroad and within Iran agrees that the, the legal structure is a part of the problem. Whether we like it or not, um, the law sets the tone for so many things. And so that is the conclusion that a lot of uh, women's rights activists came to in Iran. But they also uh, struggle, and this is what I, I learned so much from them, and this is something that as an Iranian American activist, I really had to be humbled and, and understand this lesson. They also work um, incredibly hard at on a cultural level. And so one of the things that is really um, in many ways unforgettable, unforgettable when you meet women that have been politically active in Iran is how inclusive they are and how important it is for them to include and to be in relation with Iranians um, living in the diaspora. So that has always been a part of their political agenda has been to create the, the conditions where we can travel. So there's a lot of solidarity um, with us. And also in their work, in their style of speech, if you've ever heard uh, Bahar Hedayat speak, if you've ever heard Nagisa Mohammadi speak, it is, as witnesses, they they could talk for days about the, what has happened to them and the great injustice that they've experienced, but they choose to act as witnesses for their society. And they do so with care and forgiveness and solidarity. Uh, and you know, it's very far from the language that we're hearing um, in the diaspora where people are self-nominating themselves as leaders, where, where they are, you know, um, giving a speech and blowing it out of proportion and saying that I'm leading the movement because I did this. This is just not the tradition of Iranian feminists in the country. And so those of us that know, I think we have a responsibility to highlight that. That's not to dismiss the diaspora. It's just to say, this is not a one-way relationship. We have to learn from one another and we have to find ways to deliver our message in a way that is not um, uh, connected to imperial feminism. And this is a hard pill to swallow. And it's something I had to confront. When I lived in Iran for two years, I realized that the language in my, my aspiration, which I always thought that my intentions were so noble, I thought, I just want good for people. Why is it that you know when I speak, people don't like me? What's going on? The women that I love so much, I'm not getting that back from them. And the reason was because it was very much so in a hierarchy. Mm -hmm. And so this ultimately, I think, I wish we could travel. Part of this is because so many of us are isolated. I don't think we would have these problems if we could travel and be in conversation with one another. But because we can't, um, I think we miss some of these points. And that's why I decided to speak even, you know, as someone who usually doesn't speak and uh, doesn't enjoy speaking. Uh, but I thought I had a really a responsibility 
um, to, to the Iranian community to, to highlight these points um, in a non-judgmental way. Mm -hmm. Shireen and we, you know, are so happy to have you with us talking on these <laughs> issues. Uh, in light of that, um, you know, I, I, I want to um, just go to a, a newer question that came in because I think it, it really ties into this. Um, you know, as Samila Afalka uh, mentions, you know, you've brought up this term state feminism, uh, you know, several times, and. Uh, the gains that Iranian women have made under the Islamic Republic. Um, could you could you maybe just give us a few examples of what you view those gains to have been? And you know, like you said, you know, these are gains that the movement ha or women, in some senses, are outgrowing at this point, and that's why we're seeing what we're seeing right now. But perhaps you can sort of walk us back through a, a couple of you know key and important uh, gains there. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so. Um... State feminism uh, by nature is, is very cautious and careful. And I have um, seen these women up close and I've been in conversation and meetings with them. And it is very different from uh, the kind of activism that I was used to or that I wanted to participate in. Um, but so for instance, at the end of the Iran-Iraq war, uh, many women who had lost their husbands in the war were also losing custody of their children uh, because the children would automatically go to the man's family. And so the, the wives of martyrs lobbied with uh, women in parliament to revise that law. And many attribute uh, sort of a silent revision of that, um, although it might not be so notable in, in the formal structures of the law, but uh, they account account for that transformation where pretty much when you go to court, um, you can push for the case of basically like, do, you know, equal custody. Um, they attribute that to have started um, at the end of the war by those women. Uh, but there, you know, that's a that's an old examples. So more recent examples, uh, women that have entered um, the, the state. Um, uh, so I'm thinking in particular of Parmane, as Salah Shuri, or um, uh, gosh, there's another representative. Her, her, I'll remember. I'll put her name in chat. But a lot of these uh, representatives, they had a close relationship with organized women's rights movements. And so we see women that were active in the green movement, women that have a long history of activism um, on the ground, they would work with and lobby for uh, these women who they have significant disagreements with to enter uh, the state knowing that there would be this connection. And I have to tell you, if you can get past the language and sort of the differences in appearance and style of speech, I have never witnessed that kind of solidarity. And I mean, they will not back down when it comes to certain, and that doesn't mean they win all the time. I think this is a very good question. It doesn't mean that the policies pass through, but just the solidarity and insistence that this has to be the case. Um, we have to you know, care about all of the women of Iran, not just our own particular social group. I don't wanna exaggerate it and say, oh, it's so common. It's not, but it's a part of the, the state feminism that one might witness um, in Iran. And so uh, we've seen this you know, uh, criticism of the mandatory uh, hijab law. Uh, we've seen this from politically elite women in the country as well. And they write about it in their social media even. And so, you know, again, it might not be what you and I wish to see, but I don't, under those conditions, I, I in any condition, I mean, I also think Again, judging people and saying, oh, what did you gain? Uh, you know, it's just not a nice thing to do, even in the United States when you're talking with uh, different activists. Uh, it's, not a so it's not a language of care and solidarity that is the basis of political transformation. Yeah, absolutely. And, and if I might follow up on that, um, you, know, you, you write really compellingly in your book about the way um, policies towards women and this gendered citizenship in the Islamic Republic is you know, actually very unevenly enforced or implemented, uh, you know, throughout the country, and you know, we were talking earlier about how you know, despite great diversity and uh, you know, eth ethnically, uh, you know, and class-wise, a lot of Iran is kind of coming together behind uh, issues like this. You know, maybe you can speak very briefly to the. It, well, let's talk specifically about the mandatory hijab, and you know. How how differently is that enforced in different parts of the country, and how does that impact, uh, you know, the way this protest movement has evolved so far? 
so many things uh, in, in, in the Islamic Republic are inconsistent. Uh, there is often a joke that people say, you know, our driving is like our flying, our interrogations are like our teachers' uh, discussions. I mean, the, things are not consistent. And I, I think oftentimes that inconsistency is understood to create like space for change. But really it just, it, it, it can be quite traumatic because you just never know. I mean, you, you don't know if I travel to Iran, will I be arrested or will I be able to do my research and just come back and go about my life? Uh, you don't know. So the inconsistency is a part of the terror that people live with. And so for many of us, you know, if we, uh, if we see ourselves as intellectuals or activists, uh, and this has happened, I think, for a very long time in academia, the struggles of non-elite women were dismissed because they thought, oh, that's not, you know, I'm, I'm a leftist and these are not my problems. I have bigger problems than this. Uh, and so there was a level and extent of being uh, inconsiderate about, you know, an 18-year-old girl who is not interested in politics, who is not, the state is not the center of her attention. I think this is another mistake we make as intellectuals and activists. The state is so dominant in our world. And I would argue that for a lot of non-elite women, it's just another factor among many. And they don't have that, um, it's not this huge thing that they think they can't overcome as we're seeing in the streets today when we see them triggered and mobilized, right? And so um, the issue of hijab was oftentimes dismissed, but it's really inconvenient. And it's, it's not just the inconvenience and you, know, you don't wanna wear it. It is about if you've ever been forced to wear hijab in a way that you disagree with. Uh, it's first of all, very humiliating it escapes just the state. It it's also exists in the families. And so um, it, it goes straight to your dignity and your autonomy as a human being. And I, there's just, I don't know much, I don't know what you can do except from pushing back and saying, no, I don't want this and resisting it. There is no way out of this. And I, this is why there's no compulsion in religion. I mean, this is why in Islam they say this, right? Because it just, it, it, it it's inhumane to do that to a person. And so whether it's consistent or inconsistent, and it is, and it can be very inconsistent. I mean, my family in the rural regions of the South uh, have told me that we stopped wearing, it's a couple of years that we really don't even wear it to a lot of places when we go out. Because again, for the tribal, for, you know, for the Bakhtiaris, the, the scarf is not that significant. So, um, you know, yeah, there's that, but ultimately, um, I will tell you what a student told me once when I was in Iran, uh, the students that I was, uh, that were in my department were talking about how the um, sort of the law against uh, having a dish, a, a cable dish is, uh, is a problem. And, you know, I just, you know, I turned around and I said something to the effect of, oh, but, you know, they don't really take it seriously. Nothing comes out of that, really. Like, how significant can it be? And they said, yeah, but what you don't understand is if they decide to, that means I will never be able to have a government job if someone finds that, you know. So that, to me, is what this is all about. This, this level, we need to be more sensitive about the lives of people who don't have the same commitments as we do. And that goes for activists in the diaspora, it goes for academics like myself and others. Uh, and so this continually being critical of where we stand uh, is the only way forward, I think. Mm -hmm. No, that, that's that's incredibly well taken. And, you know, it, it's, I, again, I think a very important point because you know we off. We, I think it is kind of the default to see you know irregular enforcement as um, uh, as something that creates that space, as you said, for a reform. Sorry, we're getting a ambulance by the door here, um, but um, and and likewise, like you know what you said. I mean, it's part of what makes this protest because it's centered around, uh, you know, like you first said, uh, the death of a woman in police custody and centered around the mandatory hijab, um, which in the reason it's centered around the hijab and that death is because the, the specific police organization that caused this death uh, is, the, is what's known as the morality police in Iran that enforces uh, these laws. Um, you know, the, the stakes of these things are, are, are quite high. The fear, fear of these things are quite high, but it also reaches, you know, well beyond state capacity into, into people's homes, into people's families. And, you know, it's a, it's a like you said, a, an issue that's negotiated on multiple levels, not just with the state. 
Um, that's that's incredibly important, I think, for people to, to understand. Um, we might take one or two more questions uh, from the chat, if that's all right, uh, Shireen. Um, uh, th there's a, a, a question here. Uh, it's an anonymous attendee. Uh, th they'd like to hear insight about the feminist movement and the current uh, Iranian revolution with the integration of Kurdish aspiration to revoice their national movement. Uh, and its identity as an issue under the Islamic regime. Initially, it is critical to mention this feminist movement against the regime was uh, also determined by decades of ethnic oppression of Kurds within the Iranian state, uh, even with uh, prior regimes. And I, I think this is a very important question uh, that may may not uh, be immediately apparent to many uh, in the West is that you know, Mahsa Amini was herself Kurdish. Uh, there has been a lot of uh, distinction being drawn between uh, activists in Iran in Kurdish regions versus uh, activists elsewhere voicing this protest, you know, with, as an Iranian movement and a Kurdish movement at once or separately. So help us kind of sort of tease that out just a little bit. Absolutely. Uh, first of all, let me say, I think there are um, people that are much more qualified than I am to speak about this who do research. So I don't want to get too deep into it just because I don't, I'm not the right person to do that. But I think, yes, absolutely. Uh, as far as I know, based on my research, the first time that the, the phrase uh, Zan Zindagi Azadi, woman, life, freedom, was heard was in the prisons of Iran, um, in the women's ward. Uh, women heard a, a Kurdish uh, prisoner a uh, woman writing this or saying this. So that's the first time that many activists have, you know, remember hearing it. I think th the idea that this came in prison is also very significant because um, I personally believe that uh, you know, as a political scientist, I read everything on prisons and that prisoners and former prisoners write because I think the best knowledge for freedom comes in those spaces. So I think this is absolutely an important point to highlight always. Um, and uh, yeah, this is one of the interesting aspects that we see. We see the Iranian people um, standing together with the with the Kurdish people, and that's not to say that that didn't exist before, but it's become so visible and so dominant. And I think it speaks to again um, this incredible capacity of Iranian people to unite and to work across differences and to support one another. And it's something. It's a lesson that I I think we all need to think about and and breathe in. Mm -hmm. Uh, great. So I, sort of one last, I'm going to combine a couple of questions that are in the chat, if that's okay. Um, you know, I, I want to, you know, give, you've already spoken a little bit about like, you know, how can we as individuals, you know, in the United States or, you know, outside of Iran, uh, you know, support, uh, you know, what what's happening, uh, you know, inside of Iran with women, the, the forms of solidarity that, you know, we can address, um, I, I might challenge you or ask you a little bit to talk about how, what that may look like on a policy level, uh, because, you know, I, I'm personally, I saw this uh, come out in, you know, the recent national security strategy statement that was released by the Biden administration. I personally found uh, the, the support offered to the protesters in Iran in that statement to be kind of weak. Um, and uh, I, I want to get your sense of what may happen, what could happen uh, on a policy level that might shape from the United States perspective what happens in Iran going forward. Yeah, again, I I have um, I have always avoided the policy crowd <laughs> because I, I don't know if I'm the right person for this. It's just not the kind of work I do. But just based on uh, my research, um, you know, we know that an overwhelming um, segment of Iran's population, they want to see change in their country. We know that they have the bravery and the courage to do that. Um, and uh, we, you know, there's this idea that the, the movement is leaderless. I, I disagree with that. The, the leaders are in prison. Um, the elders are in prison, whether we like them or not, or they're people that, that we favor, that's beside the point. But there, there have been people in the last 40 years that have politicized, that have informed Iranian society, and they are there. And some of them have been on house arrest for over 10 years. And so to say that there's no leadership and that there's no models for resistance, we may not be able to articulate it. I may not be able to articulate every person that has intellectually and on a genetic level influenced my thinking. It doesn't mean it's not there. And so we have a society that is um, 
intellectually and uh, politically committed. Uh, the issue, however, I think that when I think about uh, democratic change in Iran and the different forms that it could take that are sustainable, durable democracy, um, what one main thing that's standing in the way is that as long as there are sanctions, um, the state is able to co-opt half of the population, those that are in poverty, which is increasing often. Um, those people will have concerns that if things change, how will they survive? Um, when people don't have savings, they can't go on strike. And so I find the calls for more sanction and, and sort of this threat from, from the outside to be really, um, it goes against the scholarship, it goes against what the experts of various domains have been saying, various fields. Uh, and I think that my best advice to the Biden administration is to listen to the experts, listen to a diverse group of experts. It doesn't mean you just have to listen to people that you know <clears throat> I like or someone else likes, listen to a diverse group of people and you know, make decisions that support the Iranian people on the ground, the people whose names we may never know, whose voices we may not hear, um, who are standing up in, in a brave and, you know, the most inspiring of ways, support those people um, and don't fall into the, um, the different traps that might exist because of diaspora politics. Uh, Shireen, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I think that's a, an appropriate place to, to kind of close our, our conversation here. I, I'm sorry we didn't get to every question that came in through the chat, but uh, rest assured, uh, this issue is not going away. We're not going to stop paying attention to it at FPRI. Uh, please check back on our website uh, over the coming weeks and months. Uh, I'm already working on getting pieces from a variety of the exactly the experts Shireen is referring to right now uh, to tell us a little bit more about uh, the dynamics on the ground, uh, what's happening. And, uh, you know, once again, I want to reiterate, you know, these programs are only possible uh, through your support. Those of you in the audience, uh, you know, our donors, our supporters, our, our board of trustees, and uh, I couldn't be more grateful to have this opportunity uh, and to sort of you know kick off <laughs> and address this issue first in my tenure here as um, uh, director of research. Uh, Shireen Saidi, thank you so much for being here. Uh, folks, if you missed part of this conversation, it's gonna be up on YouTube a little bit later. Uh, please check out our YouTube page there, find us on social media, et cetera. Uh, and go, go read Shireen's book. Uh, it's really, really uh, rich uh, and fascinating and tells us a lot about uh, what's going on here today. Shireen, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much. It was it was a pleasure. All right. Thank you.